Okay, hello and welcome back to some real phone development. So this is iPhone and much better than the Android lecture we just had, I hope. Because this we don't have to worry about the emulator. And we don't have emulator issues and I, I swear I have to come up with a different emulator issue, a solution to my emulator issues. All right, enough about emulator issues. Today we're talking about iPhone and introduction to Objective-C and iPhone development. So today uh, I'm not going to really write too much on the iPhone. However, I did put together some introductory um, tutorials that are on YouTube that are on the uh, or from bhacker.com that will help you hopefully install Xcode and run the emulators and run. In fact, there's a nice little Hello World tutorial that you want to go through if you haven't done it already. Have you guys done it? Anyone actually do it yet? No? Homework. Do it. <laughs> Do it, do it, do it. It's easy. It's fun, too. You, know, you could say you've written your first iPhone app at that point. So, um, But before we can actually start getting into like more sophisticated stuff, we actually have to take a look. It's not Java. It's Objective-C. But it's more like C++ than it is anything else. In fact, Objective-C is an extension of C and C++. And the slide says it's actually implemented as a, an extension of the C language. I would say C++ if I were to edit the slide set, actually. I probably should. Because it's object-oriented C. It's not procedural C. So we're still working with the object concepts. Believe it or not, the same concepts apply. We have our public, private, protected kind of access methods. We have data members and member functions. And it's, it's C++ with a new label on it. So if you are familiar if with a C slash C++ slash Java, real easy language to pick up. It's designed to give C a full functionality, capability of object-oriented programming. Mm, all right, so if you take the notion that C++ was an extension of C and that Objective-C is an extension of C and that C++ and Objective-C are pretty much on the same level, they pretty much are, actually. Okay, so it's object-oriented, and to do simple and straightforward tasks that's more object-oriented than C++, actually. This is true object orientation, more similar to Smalltalk, if you've ever heard of that language. Uh, so in addition to C, um, are a few mostly based on Smalltalk, uh, one of the first object-oriented programming languages that was around. So, Why Objective-C? Uh, it incorporates C, you get the full benefits of C, with working within Objective-C. You can actually write C programs and you can use GCC, as we're, we're going to see today. Actually, I'm going to write some command line programs for you. And uh, you'll see it's uh, very C-like in a lot of different ways. So you can choose when you're doing something. In fact, you can write C code inside of Objective-C without writing Objective-C code if you want to. You can actually mix and match. In fact, Xcode comes with a GCC compiler, supports C++ and Objective-C intermixed in the same application, actually. So you can write, do internet, uh, internet, you can do Apple development, everything for the Apple platform is done in this language. So, uh, one of many different languages, this is one of them that you can choose. So you can choose uh, when you're doing something um, that's object oriented, uh, define a new class, for example, when you stick a procedural program technique, you can define a structure, you can use structures in here. Um, and some functions inside of a class instead of a method so, or instead of using a class. So everything you learned in C will not go to waste at all. And Objective-C is a simple language. Syntax is small and ambiguous, easy to learn, um, and uh, mostly dy dynamic for object-oriented languages such, uh, based on C. So Most decisions are made at runtime. So a little bit of insight into the object-oriented programming combines state and behavior data operations on data, high level input and object. Um, essentially everything that we looked at, if you've taken the object-oriented programming in C++ course that I taught um, here, or if you've taken any course in that, think about all of the different concepts in terms of the object. Uh, inheritance is also placed true as well. An object is a group of related functions and a data structure that serves those functions. Thus, the functions are known as object methods. We have methods and data members and member functions. and It's just true object orientation. Um, everything meets all of the basic patterns of Java, actually, as well, So, in terms of its object orientation. And Java, actually, is a very C-like language as well, if you think about it. Uh, it's just uh, compiled, it's compiled a lot differently, and it runs a little bit differently. So. 
Uh, so we have we don't have structures though in Java. You can't create a struct in Java. You can't create a function outside of a class. You can only create methods in Java. So Objective C actually allows you to do everything. All the rules that you can break in C++, you can break in Objective C as well. And we have instance variables and class variables as well. Uh, in terms of well, we have that in Java as well, but we have the whole virtual concept of uh, abstraction is also in there as well. So. <clears throat> All right, so a little bit more on the language. Objective C language itself is fully compatible with ANSI standard C. And we'll see that today, actually, because I'm going to run the GCC compiler and compile from command line just as if we were to compile a regular C program. And the Objective C can also be used as an extension of C. You can use it with inside C. Although C itself is object oriented, there are many differences in the dynamic binding from Objective C. Objective C is completely uh, dynamically bound and completely dynamically defined. C is static everything. So, what do I really mean by that? In fact, the, one of the big differences between C and Objective C is in a C world, we have to think about static and dynamic. And uh, we basically work with memory and uh, new and delete and uh, pointers and stuff like that in terms of creating the dynamic activity. And Objective C is the other way around. Everything is dynamic. <laughs> so we can create static stuff, but mostly it's from the dynamic thinking. Uh, which means that compile time, essentially, if, if you don't know the differences between dynamic and static compilation, or uh, excuse me, runtime. If it's compiled into the source and it's hard set before the actual program runs in the runtime, it's all static. If it's configured at runtime after the process has been created and the runtime environment's been loaded with the code, it's dynamic. So Objective-C is completely dynamic in nature. So let's get into the language. And then uh, by the end of the day, you'll go, it's just an extension on C, because it really is. Uh, so what we're looking at in terms of, uh, if you're familiar, so, so some teachers actually don't teach this method, which is kind of ridiculous. But uh, in a C++ class, you have a .C++ file, and you have a .h file. And the .h file is the specification and the dot C++ is the implementation. So the dot H has got all that function header prototypes, you know, and it defines the class. And then the C++ file, well, it implemented, it, it does implement each one of the classes, excuse me, each one of the methods. And it basically gives the implementation for that particular um, object that's being created. And then when you include files, you include the .h's, and you don't have to include all of the object code, and you end up with pre-compiled headers, because once the objects are created, they turn into .o files, and those .o files mm -hmm. hang out in a library. And every time you use a header like iostream.h, as an example, it links in the iostream.h object that gives you C in and C out and all that functionality. Same thing true for object or Objective-C. Same concept applies. It's a shame, though, because some C, C, C++ teachers, they put everything all in one file. They don't break it out for some reason, which doesn't really give you true flexibility. It gives you one program called assignment number one. <laughs> Further down the road, if assignment number one had a date class in there, along with a payroll class and an employee class, there's no way of finding that stuff. It's all under the assignment number one label. So if you are in the habit already of breaking stuff out, then you're 10 steps ahead. because. Uh, all you have to do now is take the dot C++ and turn it into dot M. And the dot H is still the dot H. It's still the specification. Except in the C++ they call it specification and implementation. In Objective-C, because now we're working with a true object-oriented language versus a makeshift object-oriented language, the dot H is actually referred to as the interface. So it gives us the interface, the public interface to the class, which is really the same as we get in a C++ environment as well. In fact, some teachers actually call it the interface. That concept, however, didn't come along till later, <laughs> but it's retroactive backwards, you know. Specification, interface, hmm. you're specifying the functions, the methods, the interface to the object, which is the purpose of that .h file. And, um, as an example here, main.m is main.c++ equivalent. It's the one holding the implementation. It's the source of the implementation. The .h is the interface. Let's say list.h would be the interface for that 
uh, list.class, disk list class, and list.m would be the implementation of the list class. Now, we don't have this in C, but this is the ID. Well, actually, we do, but it's not implemented like this. The ID concept ID is a data type used by Objective C to define a pointer of an object, so a pointer to the object's data. Instead, in C++, we have pointers. We have that little asterisk, the reference and the dereference, and we have the concept of dynamic memory. And we create it automatically. Well, Objective-C, going back to what I said a few slides ago, is all dynamic. <laughs> we don't have anything static. So we have pointers already built in, but we can still use pointers. And we still use the ID as the object pointer. So it points to the data that's being held by the object. Any type of object, <coughs> as long as it is an object, so it has to be an object, uh, can use the ID data type. And it's an actual data type that we're using, like you know, integer, float, double, ID. Uh, for example, <coughs> we can define an object by ID space an object. It's a reference to the object. So nil is the reserved word for null objects as well. Uh, so we have an object here. This would be nil because we didn't assign it. It's a reference to an object, but we haven't assigned it an instance of an object yet. So the same concept of reference variables, references to objects, and then instances of objects exists. So objects are created with references. An example, this would be a reference to an object. And we would say a new object. We would actually create a new instance of the object and assign it to the reference to keep track of it. Um, if we were to put a dynamic, um, excuse me, if we were to put a name on it. We also have what's called dynamic typing, and this is identical to the dynamic version of C++. If you go new this, new that, and you create new objects, and it's dynamically bound. So the ID data type has no information about the object. So every object carries with it an is a instance uh, variable. It's an instance variable that identifies the object's class. That is, what kind of object is it? The true implementation of it in C++ exists, but we don't have an is a instance sort of um, utility to it in C++. Instead, we have that abstraction of typecasting, upcasting uh, to, let's say, if we have a hierarchy of objects and we start out with um, a person as a, an object and we inherit from person an, uh, an employee, and so an employee is also a person, which is that is a relationship. And then an employee could be a teacher, could be a janitor, could be you know any one number of different types of employees. Um, then you'd have three relationships. So if you were a janitor, you're a janitor object. You're also a janitor is is a employee, which is a person. And so you have three layers, three objects in one, three instances. And in C plus plus you cast. You use a, it looks like typecasting, and it's actually called upcasting, where you go from a, you go from a person, actually you can only up through the hierarchy, so you can start at a janitor, and you can upcast to an employee, and you can upcast to a person. You normally can't go the other way. You can't take a person and turn them into something they're not. <laughs> so, you, take, you can't take an employee who's a janitor and turn him into, to turn him into a teacher. It doesn't happen that way. So. Kind of like life it doesn't happen that way. You're born a certain way, and that <laughs> you can't you can't change it. Actually, you can in life, but in object orientation, you can't. So, all right. So, every object carries and is a relationship. The objects are thus dynamically typed at runtime. Whenever it needs to, the runtime system can find the exact class that an object belongs to, just by asking the object what it is, and you can get back. Uh, I'm a this. I'm a that. What do you need that for? Well, it's hard to keep track of objects essentially, and. Uh, in C++, it's there. You just have to do it manually um, in terms of being able to, to figure out what it is. So we have object identity. We also have states, which is going to be holding the... Uh, the states are going to be holding the data, the data members that are associated with the object. Same concept as C++. And then we have the behaviors. Behaviors are the messages. And the messages are the communication between the objects. Same concept as any other object or any programming language. Syntax is a bit different. And this is where it kind of differs a little bit. And what I'm showing you today is the syntax of Objective-C. Once we learn the syntax and get familiar with it, then we can write iPhone applications easily. Because when we start looking at the examples in the next week, because next week I'll actually have some iPhone examples for you. And when you're looking at the syntax, I don't have to go through all that stuff. You can kind of hopefully remember some of it. 
So to get an object to do something, <coughs> you have to send it a message by telling it to apply a method. So it's running your method, member functions, methods, whatever you are familiar with and calling them. In Objective C, message expressions are enclosed in square brackets. Ugh, this is the weird part. And then anything, you know, it's like receiver message. Oh, okay, the receiver is an object. The message is simply the name of the method and the arguments that are being passed to it. So from the receiver objects, we're running a message. And I have some examples coming up, though, to put it all together for you. <coughs> so in this particular example, uh, the message tells my rectangle object to perform its display method, which causes the rectangle to display itself. So my rec is as we're not using a dot notation anymore. So if we had uh, C++ and we were going to write this method invocation, we would go my rec dot display open bracket uh, 30 comma 50 close bracket semicolon. So the syntax is the same concept, but there are no dots. Instead of the dots, we've got brackets. But we still have semicolons at the end of the line. So slightly different syntax. Same concept, identical concept. <clears throat> so the method uh, set origin colon colon scope resolution operator the two colons one for each of its arguments not used as a scope resolution operator in this particular um, in this particular case the arguments are inserted after the colons breaking the name apart so we can uh, essentially say colon number one t -t -t space colon number two so it's telling us that <clears throat> of set origin, we have two arguments that we're passing as parameters to this method call. This is the first one. This is the second one. We don't see it together like this. We see it separated. So if we have to, we leave the first one blank. We put the second one here. The first one's blank. We've just passed it the second argument. So <clears throat> Polymorphism is supported in the language, obviously. It's a true object-oriented language. So each object has defined its own methods, but for different classes, its own method, but for different uh, classes they can have the same method name, which uh, was totally, it has a different meaning to it. So we can have multiple different methods with the same method name with different functionality and different meaning, which means different objects can perform differently to different types, to the same message actually. So they have the same method name, but they can have different meanings. So two different objects can respond differently to the same message depending upon the implementation of the method that's controlling the message. So together with dynamic binding, it permits you to write code that might apply to any number of different types or kinds of objects without having to choose at, which, at the time that you're writing the code what the object might be. As an example, <clears throat> there might be, um, going back to a, let me put this in a, I can't use employees for this, but let's, let's use shape. So we have a base class called shape, and in there it has an uh, area. And then we derive from shape a rectangle and a square and a triangle. And then the area of our circle. And so, and so we can implement different, and we can still call it area. And we could call from the shape, if it's a triangle, the area, and it would run the triangle area versus the circle area versus the square area. And as we implement the different methods, we're keeping the same name, but we're changing the implementation details to match the identity of the particular shape that we're inheriting from it. And it's really polymorphic behavior when we tell the shape, give me your area. It's like, oh, well, it's going to be different depending upon whichever type. So the ability of the object, the wharf, to run the, to find the most appropriate method that's associated with its implementation. Same concept as C++ actually, in fact, it's done through overloading and overwriting in virtual methods in C++. Um, so. Same object hierarchy exists, but instead of coming from object, the root is now NS object. Uh, so in object uh, C++, we've got object on the top. So root class is NS object. Inheritance is accumulative, same concept as C++. So a square object has a method and an instance variable defined for rectangle shape, graph, and in its object. So square down here is rectangle, uh, excuse me, square, rectangle, shape, graphic, and its object. Uh, so it's a cumulative, same thing with C++, and uh, we can follow through the lines of inherent hierarchy. 
inheritance. Same thing is true as well. In a square, we have graphic methods, graphic data, anything that would be exposed or inherited through the line. We're containing all of the original functionality of the previous hierarchies. Instance variables. So a new object contains not only the instance variables that were defined for its class, but also the instance variables that were defined for its superclass, and all the way back to the root. Same thing true for C++, actually. So if we keep adding variables, instance variables, to each one of the... And it, it, it only really applies towards instance variables. Class variables aren't really relevant in terms of the instance. It's the controlling of the class and not necessarily the instance. And it's working from an instance state in terms of this environment. Uh, but everything is inherited through the lines. And methods, an object uh, that has access not only to the methods, but that were defined in this particular class, but those that were defined in all the other classes above it, the superclasses above it. So it inherits all as well as the methods. Method overloading also exists. It's the same concept that exists in C++ as well. So in terms of method overloading, or overwriting, excuse me, uh, you implement a new method with the same name as the one defined in the class farther up the hierarchy. The method overrides the original. Same true for C++. Uh, instances of the new class will perform that method rather than the original method. So it's basically, I, I call it overriding, writing. I use the word writing is what I'm saying it, but it's really overriding. But really, what are you doing? You're overwriting. <laughs> so overriding, overwriting, same concept. So class objects. So same concept as C++, actually. And I'm comparing this to C++ because I'm assuming that most of you guys are already familiar with C++. And if you're not familiar with C++, compare it with Java because it's a C++ in Java. Kind of similar in terms of a lot of the object-oriented features, although Java is actually more object-oriented. So C++ sort of breaks the rules. And Objective-C kind of breaks the rules the same way as C++ does, more so. All right, so the compiler creates one class object to contain the information of the name of the superclass, uh, of the class and the superclass. So to start an object in a class, in this particular example, ID, the reference type, my rectangle x, my rectangle is equal to a rectangle alloc in it. The alloc method returns the new instance of the instance performed an init method to set the initial state. So we have the init to set the initial state, which is, think of it sort of like running a, running a default constructor, but manually. Instead of in C++ where you don't actually have to say init, don't set a default state. It actually sets it itself automatically. And in terms of alloc, it's sort of like the new, you know, create a new, and since you allocate the memory for it. So alloc returns, the method returns an instance, and the instance performs an init, which basically sets the initial state sort of like an constructor type of behavior. Constructor is what I'm saying, not instructor. In terms of the definition of the class itself, and we'll see some examples of uh, in making new objects actually in a few minutes. Um, in terms of defining its two parts, I talked about the interface and the implementation, the .h and the .m. The interface itself that declares the method and the instance variables of the class and the superclass and the names names its superclass where it's being inherited from. The implementation itself is the actual def definition of the class contains the code that implements the methods that uh, are being run. And here's the syntax for the interface. This is for the .h file. So the declaration of the class begins with the compiler directive here, the at interface, and ends with the end. So in C++, what does it say? You know, you, you type, well, actually Java is you, you have interface classes. So C++ doesn't actually even have this interface concept in terms of the syntax. Instead, it's a, oh, class so-and-so. <laughs> public class something or other. You, get, you, have that, you have the public, you have the private, you have the access method, then you have the, the word class that shows up everywhere. You don't have the word class that shows up anywhere, but you're creating a implant, a, an interface to the class. So you're really defining the class if you think about it. So the syntax is a little different. You're always going to use the at interface, class name. And then this is, this is identical to C++, actually. 
instead of putting public my other class up here, you're leaving out you're leaving out access methods, you're leaving out the word class, and you're calling it an interface. And this is the contents of the .h file. So any instance variable declarations, any method declarations, same as a, in fact, you can take a .h file from a C++, swap out the word class, put the interface in there, take out the public, private, and everything else in there, take out the access methods, and uh, it's the same syntax for everything else, actually. And uh, you can put the methods on top, or you can put the methods down below in C++. In Objective-C, the format is you're putting the data on the top and the methods down below it. So the data is, the method declarations are actually coming outside of the implement, uh, outside of the declaration of the variables that are going to exist. And then instead of having the um, class open and close with curly brackets, you're having it with the interface in the end. Of the end. So the, you know, the syntax is significantly different. Uh, but it's the same concept being implemented. <clears throat> and here's some different um, different things as well. In terms of the declaration, our instance uh, variables here float with float. That should look familiar. So object type ns color uh, pointer to fill color pointer variable. Uh, everything that you're familiar with with C plus plus in terms of your instance variables identical practically. You can still make uh, pointers, you can still make uh, floats, integers, doubles, all the diff different built-in types that you're familiar with. In terms of the methods, these are a little different. We have pluses and minuses, and this actually comes from a UML kind of syntax, actually. If you've ever done any UML, and you've ever did class diagrams with boxes, you had plus this method, plus minus that method, and the names and the methods can be used by class objects, class methods. Those are preceded by the plus sign. So used by class objects or class methods, that would tell you that it's a class variable. Excuse me, a class method. It could be used by class objects. Or the minus, the method that instances of the classes can use. Instance methods are marked with a minus sign, which means they're instance, which is interesting. So we've got the class level and we have the instance variables. Excuse me, we have methods better of the class level and <laughs> of the instance level. Blah. It's like tongue twister today. So. And that actually, this is the only part that really does throw people off. And just remember, nine times out of ten, you'll be using a minus sign. Why? Because you're, you're going to be creating instances of objects. And so you'll have to remember, and you'll leave out the minus sign next to it. And it looks funny in the code for a while, and then you can get sort of used to it. And then you go back to C++, and you go, how come where's the minus sign? There's no minus sign. <laughs> There's no public, private, or protected here either. So it's like, so it's, it's a little different. So, uh, but yeah, nine times out of ten, you're going to put a minus sign, and you'll just start putting minus signs in there until you're trying to you get into habit, and then you'll forget what it's even for. And because everything's a, everything's an instance method if you think about it. But there are some situations where you want to create a class method. You want to run it by the class. So, declarations. Let's go back to that one as a uh, side note here. Importing the interface. Now we're kind of thinking about Java. Now it kind of looks like Java to me. So <coughs> import instead of include. Uh, so the interface is uh, usually included with the hash time import directive. So import rectangle.h. It doesn't look like include. Because in C++ we actually use the word include. But in Java we use import. <laughs> so this is like borrowing and stealing from both languages in terms of the syntax. <coughs> so to reflect the fact that the class definition builds on the definition of the interface classes, an interface file begins by importing the interfaces for which it is superclass of. Now, it's the same concept actually as C++ includes. So if we were to build the concept of the rectangle inside the implementation, we would import rectangle.h so that we can have that interface to that object code that's actually created for us. And it's done the same way, so it's to create the interface. So referring to other classes, we can do that as well. So if the interface mentions classes not in this hierarchy, but in other hierarchies, it must declare them with this at class directive. So we have an at class rectangle, comma, circle, 
which means it's referring to a rectangle and a circle that's not in this hierarchy, it's in a different hierarchy. It's in there somewhere, but it's not of this generation in terms of the inheritance line. Which is interesting because we don't, well, we do have that capability. In Java, we would uh, have a package. <laughs> we would use a package concept with that. So. In C++, we would include it, actually. We, have, we don't have packages in C++. But we do have project scope, which is interesting, which is not accounted for. <coughs> well, right, let's take a look at the implementation. And uh, we're going to implement some functionality here. So what are we going to implement? We are going to implement a class name.h, which is the interface that we're importing. And the implementation here, so we, now we have the data members. So this is like, if you were to say class, my class, this is what this is really doing. This is the implementation instead of the interface. So we use the word implementation, at implementation, and at interface, if it depends on whether we're defining it or implementing it. The method declarations themselves, uh, the definitions, excuse me, themselves, and then at the end, to end the definitions. Minus sign says it's an instance method, and it's going to be called make identical twin. We have an uh, opening and closing bracket, same syntax as you might before, and this is actually going to look very similar as well, because we've got, you know, if not a twin, then make a twin, essentially. The twin is going to be equal to sibling new, make a new sibling, essentially, alloc, uh, to, to create that instance and initialize it. Twin, uh, this is like the dot gender, but it, again, follows the same syntax because this is dynamic. It's using that arrow instead of the dot notation. So it's the same meaning, actually, in C++. The gender, make it equal to the gender. The appearance, make it equal to the appearance. And then return the twin, essentially. So the method call itself is um, interesting to, to observe in terms of its changing. It's, it's pretty much similar in terms of its implementation. That would be the in a C++ environment is what I was trying to compare it to. Um, in terms of an example, here we have uh, the interface worker that's inherited from NS object, which is this is the higher higher superclass. This is the subclass character name. It's a pointer name, uh, and then we have private, protected, and public. Look at that. We still have it, except for instead of going private colon protected colon public colon. Take away the colon and use an at symbol for everything. So a lot of the syntax is in the form of at. So at private. Well, the private. The two variables that we're going to have are integer age and evaluation. And then the protected and it's actually done the same. The, the access methods actually mean the same thing as they do in C++, which is good. Uh, it's consistent. Protected ID job, uh, float wage, public ID boss. So. And you see the ID is in the object reference. So we have that. It's a data type. So you have to get used to that object reference data type as well. Um, it's a generic object reference type. In C++, we actually have it. It's object, or it's this. Actually, it's this super object. You can call it object. You can actually cast an object. And it's an object data type. It's a generic object, essentially. And then we have a method that is an instance method because it has the minus sign here. It's promote to a new position. That's where it's coming from, implementation-wise. ID old is equal to job. ID is a new position, return old. So the same return concept is there as well. well the parameter list is different, obviously. The parameter says it's going to take on a new position here. So, in fact, uh, this one is, uh, well, that's an interface coming from in, uh, inheritance, but this is this is basically specifying that there's a new position coming and then the job is going to be equal to the new position. So. <clears throat> so as we go through some of the examples, you'll sort of just see the syntax that use. There's no way of learning how to program in this language by reading PowerPoint slides. <sighs> you actually have to implement, which is kind of the purpose of this course, so we'll have some practical hands-on implementation. Um, so GCC and Objective-C. So Objective-C is layered on top of the C language iPhone, iPad, native applications are written in Objective-C. There are some libraries out there that take Objective-C and they build a wrapper on top of it and they make the wrapper JavaScript. And they make it HTML. And you can buy these APIs and you can install them 
in your Xcode actually, and you can write code in HTML, and you can write code in JavaScript, and all it's doing is a translation into Objective-C. Real life on people, they program in an Objective-C. <laughs> Because what ends up happening is it's like the same way you have any sort of translation, the app that you create is going to run slower. If you go from HTML to Objective-C, the, the translation isn't going to be as feature rich, and the translation will probably end up, well, it has to be translated when it gets compiled. However, it's kind of like going from C to assembly. If assembly was a nicer language to work with, everyone would do that, but it's not a nicer language, so they program in C instead, but all that C code that you're writing is actually get, gets translated into assembly language and the trans assembly language gets translated into machine code and the machine code gets translated along with the runtime environment for your executable file and your target machine. Same kind of concept, it depends on how many hierarchies you want to go through. A lot of the application generators though, however, add a overhead and so the apps actually end up running a little bit slower. It's not a direct translation, it's like a API on top of it, which is kind of weird. Uh, so you want to you want to get familiar with Objective C only because it makes your life a lot easier, um, and it's true native. So it's also uh, the Apple Dev Kit for Objective C is called Coca, or Coco -co -co. Is that how you say that? Coca, Cocoa, Cocoa, Cocoa. I don't know. Coco, Coco. You know, I say like a Coco, like you know, Coco, like that you drink. So, um, so if you've ever seen that that. Uh, I never really pronounce it correctly, but with the, if you see the cocoa, it's the, uh, it's the, well, and you learn how to do iPhone, iPad development with Xcode, and you can write uh, Mac you know, OS X applications. It's all done with the same language. It's all done in Objective-C. So it can be written on any computer that has a GCC plus GNU setup plugin, which means you can actually program on a Windows machine if you want to. You don't actually have to use a, a MacBook for it. Unfortunately, however, it's harder to test it because <laughs> eventually you've got to run the emulator for the iPhone or you have to have an OS X system to run the application on. It's not going to run on your Windows and if you put the emulator, you're going to load a virtual machine and then you're going to load OS X on top of it and then you're going to run it on your Windows machine, which is kind of backwards actually. It's, kinda, it's harder to do than just to go out and buy a cheap MacBook or something. And now when I say cheap, everyone goes, they're not cheap. That's the problem. A lot of people don't want to buy them because they're expensive. Older ones. Only problem with buying older ones, especially if you want to do iPhone development, is you want the last two operating systems. You can't go anything below Leopard right now. It's not supported anymore. Snow Leopard is Leopard. Lion is definitely supported. In fact, the API just came out for it. But anything below Leopard, I did my little homework on it the other day, not available anymore. <laughs> so it kind of sticks you know, between a rock and a hard place because you don't, you know, you want to be able to test it. You don't want to spend a lot of money on a computer, but you can't buy an old computer because then you can't load Xcode on it. So it's just kind of like it's not very, I don't know. Uh, so long story short, you're going to end up having to spend a little bit more money if you're developing in this environment because you need to get yourself a decent MacBook, uh, a Leopard or a Snow Leopard. I believe I'm actually running Snow Leopard on my computer. Uh, I've upgraded it. This is actually an older MacBook, but it supports it. Uh, so what do we have here? Apple computers are all uh, pre-installed. And also have iPhone and simulators and Xcode. I wouldn't say it's pre-installed with Xcode. Xcode takes up a lot of memory. It used to be in the old days. Now you have to install Xcode. And be prepared to take a few minutes, take an hour or so to install Xcode, and then lose, lose some disk space from it a little bit. But You'll like it. It's much better than the, um, runs a lot faster and a lot smoother than the Android emulator in the Android environment. So the tools, Apple's pre-installed with Cocoa Framework, Cocoa Framework, Xcode, and GCC in the terminal window. In fact, I'm going to demonstrate to you in a few minutes how we can run GCC and compile Objective-C programs. We're going to write a few Hello World stuff and stuff like that. So. Ubuntu GNU setup is free clone. There's a free clone actually if you've got a Ubuntu system and next week I'm actually going to probably, I shouldn't promise, I'm trying to fix my Android issues so I'm setting up, I've decided I'm, within the last hour I've decided I'm going to set up a Ubuntu system for myself to see if the Android tools will run faster. And I may actually experiment running because then I can do the Android and the iPhone off of the same computer perhaps, we'll see. Uh, but there's a utility GNU setup 
for a clone. So you can actually do Mac development on a Linux box, essentially. Well, this is a Linux box, so it's, it's almost, it's more compatible than a Windows box. So, And you can run through the steps for it. There's also a Windows GNU setup. You can go to windowsgnusetup.org if you are so inclined and refuse to spend the money for a MacBook. You might actually be able to do it on a Windows system. Although it's going to take you longer than ins downloading and installing Xcode on a MacBook. Uh, so we've seen the file overview already. Source code uh, has a .m extension. Headers have .h. And we use a GCC compiler in the same way as C. But you need to include or need to add the Coco or the GNU setup framework to build it. So this is where it's going to be a little different. So here's my hello world, as promised. And the program itself, I've taken the liberty to actually uh, stick out here. And uh, let's see where I was here. Let's just take a look here. Where am I? Let's just take a look here. Oh, good. I'm in the right place, at least. And I've got hello.m. So if I... Uh, Type out, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write up nano hello.m. I can see the source code here. And uh, nano is kind of like VI, and I, it's kind of old school, actually. I could open it up in a text editor through a GUI, but it's just easier to open it up this way. And I can sort of see the uh, import foundation, foundation X, which is for the GCC compiler to give me the foundational framework for Coco is what this is doing. If you're going to do this on a Windows machine using the GNU setup emulator slash library set that supports it, you'll have a different import or include, actually. Here's main. That should look very similar. In fact, identical practically to C, C code. And we're going to create an object here, and the object we're going to create is going to be a, uh, well, it's going to be a NS auto lease pool, and this is a pointer. This 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 here could appear here, could be appeared here. It's just regular pointer syntax. And uh, we're creating a new instance of auto release pool, and we're initializing it, which is going to basically run its construct. It's going to initialize the object. So we're declaring and initializing it, and we're inserting code here. But eventually, we're going to use this. This is sort of like printf or C out actually. It's NS log, and NS log is going to print. This tag actually is going to remind you of Android very soon. <laughs> it's very similar kind of syntax for a string, and it's identifying the string hello world, and then we're going to close, we're going to drain the pool, which is kind of an interesting concept. It was just close, shut down, clean up, and then we're going to return zero. And in the slide set, oops, we see the code here. And uh, it's the same code you just looked at a few minutes ago. So NSLog is equivalent to the C printf, uh, very similar to C. C programs are valid in Objective C, just as a reminder. Actually, you can take a C program and compile it with Objective C. In fact, you can write C code in your Objective C programs and compile it as C, Objective C inside of the C. It actually gets translated quite nicely. So if we want to compile it, so we're going to compile the hello world in Xcode. It's actually quite easy. Uh, you just go file new projects. Uh, and I have Xcode on here. You could select the application, select the command tool, type in foundation, name the project hello world, choose a folder. Uh, let's just see it happen. Uh, actually, I have to exit out of here to see it happen. Let's just exit out real quick. Oh, slide number 26. So for those of you who have Xcode installed, it um, runs a lot better. It was just the same speed. I want to say it runs in about the same speed as um, as uh, Eclipse does. And it's menu-driven. So actually, I'm going to close this out here. Uh, Control x There we go. Just minimize this, because I'm going to go back and compile it on the command line prompt as well. You can use the terminal window to compile, or you can bring this up in Xcode, actually. If you bring it up in Xcode as the instructions are telling you to do, we would uh, get we would create a new Xcode project, and we would select the uh, command line interface down here on the bottom where it would say application, because uh, we're, we're creating a console command console. We're not creating a GUI hello world. Um, and this is the command line tool, and this is the foundation. Uh, 
framework, which is what we're actually importing into our application. So we're using this framework. So if we did that, I could go choose, and then I can say um, test, you know, test program, test program, save. And then I would end up with a project here that would have a .m file in here. And if I looked into the source, I would actually see. And here, here's our Hello World program, actually. Uh, let me make this a little bigger so you can see it. That is the source code I showed you on the slide um, that I have actually cut and pasted. And I put it into a .m file and I put it on the website. Um, excuse me, I put it out in the terminal prompt because I have to. I want to show you how to do it on the command line as well. It seems like a lot of work to open up a project for a simple Hello World program like that. Uh, which is why I'm going to demonstrate to you the command line interface for it. But in order to run this program in Xcode, and this is sort of your tutorial in Xcode as well today, we would uh, build and run. So if you clicked on build and run, and you are terribly disappointed because nothing happens. So instead, you either have to open up the terminal command window, or you have to go down here where it says products, and say, well, what, can, what is the product? Well, this is the executable file here. Actually, this is the object that was created. And if you double click on it, you see the terminal window open up, and you see Hello World being printed to the screen. But I had to get to that by double clicking on the products that were produced. Well, the products was the compiled code. It's a command line interface code. So there is a way of getting it uh, to show up in a window down here, but if it doesn't show up automatically, depending upon your view, I've closed the window, but you can open up a terminal window inside of Xcode and actually have it automatically show up for you. Um, but if you can't, you can't find it, it's important to note that it's under products. In fact, you can actually uh, make sure it compiles if you see something under products, which is nothing more than the bin directory in the old days, you know, where the binaries got stored. If you're a former Visual C++ or a student, Visual Studio person, it's like, or, Visual Basic is always in that. Um, so the uh, the breakdown of Xcode, if you're not familiar with it, if you haven't seen it yet, it's actually kind of broken down into automatic documentation, which is kind of um, this test program dot one, which is going to be the notes that are associated with it. You're not really going to touch that at all. Instead, what you're going to be familiar with is looking in terms of the source files, and the source files here is just going to be our basic because we're just working with, we don't really have a class that we're building in here. In fact, we just have the .m, which would be normally our main .c++ that we'd normally get with a default program that we were creating. So let's see the command line interface to it as well, um, just to put the pieces together. Um, so I'm not going to bring this back up. I'm just going to go like that with it. There we go. Uh, so what we did is I just basically demonstrated those steps to you. Um, so I'm not going to read through the slide, but uh, we built it, we debugged it, we saw the console that showed Hello World on it. Now we can write Hello M using a plain text editor if we wanted to, like I just showed you the nano editor a few minutes ago. And uh, we can compile it using this command line uh, tool right here which should look very similar to your old GCC if you ever did this in the past. And so if I exit out here, <coughs> and um, paste it in the command, what I'm running is just a regular old GCC command, which is a C syntax, actually. And that's going to take, and I'll show it to you here so you can probably see it on the bottom of the screen here, GCC minus or dash sign framework foundation, you know, which is the packet, which is the library that we're including. Hello M dot O hello. So we're going to call it hello. So just like an old C program. So if I collect it, it's going to say no such file or directory. Oh, that's great. Probably because I'm not in it. Let's see. Oh, I'm not. Oh no, there I am. I am in it. Let me just specify the location. No, no such file. No such file or directory framework. Okay, well, theoretically, if it's, uh, I may not have it installed correctly, theoretically, it should actually compile for me. Um, actually, let me try something else real quick, though. Just see if it's in here. Mm 
<laughs> I ran it a couple of days ago. Uh, hold on one second. So how far back history goes. I, I may have been using a different framework when I loaded it, actually. This is what I'm looking for in my history. It depends on how far back it goes. Because I can't remember off the top of my head what framework I included. Or it could be that I just need to include framework without foundation next to it. Uh, let's see. It's all Java stuff. Hold on. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to give it a little bit more time, then I'm going to give up on it. Problem is, I ran another Java. I ran some uh, uh, RMI stuff. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Uh, Hello.m, I thought I had it in here. I do. Hmm. That is the correct syntax because my exe2.m compiled correctly. Uh, interesting. Maybe I typed it wrong. It could be that I had an extra character or something when I cut and pasted it is what I'm thinking right now. So. I did. All right, so I cut and pasted the command into the window and put an extra character I couldn't see on the screen. Uh, long story short, the command does work. <laughs> so, uh, what I'm looking at now then is uh, the ability just to type in, just as if I had a .o file, or excuse me, o.out, but I named it uh, in this particular case hello. So if I typed in hello, the program would run as it says hello world, uh, just like a regular old uh, C++ program. So what I'm going to do is kind of run through a couple more examples to show you the more capabilities in terms of the GCC um, and also uh, a few th different things about Objective-C to put the pieces together essentially. So the foundation brings the foundation framework of the COCO, uh, which is needed, bundles together a set of dependencies, the headers, the libraries, the files. It's sort of like uh, including it in terms of uh, telling GCC that you're going to link in that particular framework. So you need to do this every time you compile an Object-C code. It's just that you have to include that by default. So if you typed in, which I just did a few minutes ago, you see the hello program running the terminal. This approach is fine as a, you know, for earlier examples. Um, but for the iPhone itself, it's easier to build it in Xcode because Xcode is going to actually have the ability to run it with the emulator. Um, so if we ran the program in Xcode and if we were creating an iPhone application in Xcode, which is done exactly the same way, same steps, it would run uh, just fine, essentially. Uh, with an emulator, it would bring up the emulator. And next week, we'll start in with uh, simple iPhone applications, and we'll see it run in the emulator. But uh, this next example is example number two. And example number two is a sort of a higher level hello world. And uh, I just actually compiled that a few minutes ago. And it's, it's basically showing you an example of taking on uh, command line arguments uh, excuse me, not command line arguments, uh, setting data. So this one is going to set uh, undergrad, postgrad, and graduate students. And instead of just working with a string, you can see we sort of still have the printf that's going to the screen here. But instead, what we're doing is uh, we're going to do a little calculation now featuring this many computer science students and that many um, other students <coughs> in terms of um, uh, the... Um, the program functionality. And just to explain a few things that I uh, skipped over actually accidentally a few minutes ago by going too far. Uh, the syntax of the draining the, of the pool and cleaning everything up and the, the string itself. Objective-C uses a string class very similar to the um, if you're using a namespace you would not normally put the, uh, you'd probably put namespace std at the top of it, but in this particular case it would be SDT, SDT for standard namespace colon, colon for scope resolution string, or the Java string, which is the same concept, actually. This is the NS string. So the NS string is equivalent to the string. So the same as the NS object is equivalent to the object. Constant NX, NS, NS strings are preceded by this at sign, as we've seen already. For example, the hello world. You'll also note the NS log. 
shotgun to as output, and we've seen already. It outputs time and date and various different extra information as well. So it's a little bit more than just putting a string to the screen. It actually can be used for more functionality than a regular old system out or a printf. The auto release pool uh, pointer to pool allocates a lump of memory for the object in terms of, and think of this sort of like a new statement to take and create uh, memory for a new object. And the memory is freed with the pool drain. So the pool allocation and then the pool drain, which is uh, emptying the water out of the pool, I guess. Uh, so the example number two, some things to note about it, and I'll run it in a few minutes so you can see it. There's no line breaks between uh, needed at the end of the NSLog statement. So the NSLog statement here doesn't actually have a return on it. There's no line break needed. And the NS string constant uh, uses a C string variable. And test this program to see the results. So let's see. This particular program, and you, you can cut and paste these uh, examples actually out of the slides, put them in a text file, um, compile them, and then I've actually already compiled the EX. I've, I've compiled this one already, so I'll just type this in ext2. And this one is another hello world, essentially, that's using uh, the string instead of just the log to print it out to the screen. And in terms of the interface, we haven't seen this yet. We've just been creating .m files. I'm going to put a .h and a .m file together in this next example. And uh, the interface class that's going to be uh, uh, parent, you know, following through with this, this format here, is the equivalent to the C class declaration, as we've seen already. Goes in the .h file. Functions outside of the curly brackets. Don't forget the thing at the end. The other thing that is different that I didn't mention before, the function, the member functions do end up outside of the interface declaration. So the opening and closing curly brackets are only around the data that's being used for the class. And all of the member functions, because we're using the minus sign to say that it is a, um, a instance one, is in, outside of the curly brackets. A lot of people think that is scope. It's really not, actually. It's uh, the implementation is all in one file, so it belongs to that class, if you think about it. Um, or excuse me, the interface. Uh, also, same true for the inter implementation. Here we're going to include. Look at that. It looks like C plus plus. You can use C plus. Excuse me. You can use C plus plus inside of Objective C. I'm trying to show you, demonstrate you in here. So you can include instead of importing computer science H and computer science H would be this file here. And you can define methods inside and other things equivalent to the C or the dot C or the dot C++, goes in a dot M, not forgetting the end tag at the end of the, uh, end of the implementation. So example number three, the code would look like this, or does look like this. I have this cut and pasted already, and I'll compile it and run it in a few minutes so you can see the files. We have two data members. We have one, two, three instance methods that are being run, and the instance methods are going to set and uh, or excuse me, are, are going to use an integers and in both in both of them. One of them is going to print it. The other two are going to set the number of graduates and set the number of postgraduates or undergraduates and graduates. Some things to note about it: the NS object is the root. Obviously, as a kind of a repeat, uh, instead of object, it's coming from NS object. So we actually have to put that in, which is kind of weird. In C, if it's coming from object and it's not inheriting from anything, you don't have to put that in there. You just create the new class. In uh, Objective-C, you actually have to say specifically it's coming from NSObject. No direct access to the instance variables, so we write some set and get instance methods. So we have the set and the get, the set post, the set uh, post undergraduate, postgraduates, we could have a, a get, so we don't necessarily have the constructor concept that's going on. Instance methods are affect internal state of the class, and they're preceded by the minus sign, obviously, so we can reiterate that point. Class methods, higher level functions, they're preceded by the minus sign, they create a new class. So then we have method return types that are in the parentheses, semicolons before the list, and now this is the method return type, it's an integer return type, and the semicolon is giving us returning an integer for undergrad, returning an integer for postgrad. And uh, semicolon before it, obviously. And then the parameter list is parameterized, <coughs> followed by the name. So we have the name that's after the parameter list. And this is what the .m file looks like. In terms of, uh, this was the .h, and this is the .m. And the .m is basically going to have our include. 
.h file, obviously. And it's going to say implementation instead of interface. And we're going to have the implementation of the print and the implementation of set undergrads and set postgrads, which is nothing more than returning, you know, this one, this is going to be equal to the data. So the parameter that we send it is going to be equal to the undergrads and the parameter is going to be equal to the postgrads. Some things to note about it. Uh, no prefix minus signs are in here. Excuse me. Note to the prefix minus signs that are in here. <laughs> For instance, methods. <laughs> they are in there. They should be in there. Very similar to C. Same format as the interface. So the implementation and the interface are same, like, sim similar format, I should say. So. And if I were to take a look at this, I would know that they were both in the same corresponding directory. This would be example number three. Or is it example number two? Or maybe it's example three. Uh, don't necessarily need to run it, but as a concept, you would know. I think it's in here somewhere, but in essence, you would compile it the same way using the same command line interface, and one would find the other. And uh, I don't know if it's in here or not. Maybe it is example three. Let's see. I'll use this here. No, I don't have an, it's not main. No, I don't think I've cut and pasted it. It's not in there, so I'm not going to bother. I did not uh, create that one in a text file, so I'll leave that one alone. In, uh, it's either that or a, yeah. It's actually, it is. You know what? It's part of this next one. So we have main, uh, which is we've created this class called computer science, and it has a .h and a .m. And that's going to be the object that's going to be called from main, and main's going to be our driver program just like our C++ environment. So main is actually going to use computer science.h, which is why um, it, it's, it, I, I believe that I have uh, included computer science.h out here. I should have it here. Yep, here it is here. These are the two corresponding files that are going to be used with main uh, in terms of the implementation of this. And uh, in this here, it's just going to be like a C++ main program, driver program. We're going to make an instance of the object, and we're going to use the object, essentially call the methods on the object. The interesting thing is uh, in terms of the message, the methods themselves, and uh, this, if I go back, actually this is slide number 37, the red lines are bothering me. If I go to slide 37 here, if I go back to the minus the red lines, I can highlight two and show you what I'm talking about. We've seen all this code already, so in essence, uh, you can cut and paste, create the files. The thing to note is the method calls here. So we're making, uh, in main, we're making an instance of the object that we created of computer science, and we're calling set grads, and we're giving it, we're passing it 2000, and it's from ITU computer science, which is the name of the object that we created, which was of type computer science from the object that we created in a .m and .h file corresponding to it. So as we pass the parameters to it, we can see the method invocations. And this is the interesting part to note uh, because it's the different syntax that uh, you'll just have to become familiar with in terms of the coding. So, so some things to note about the driver program. Applying the methods to the instance format, as I mentioned before, the receiver and then the message in this particular format here is what you're paying attention to. The semicolon for the variables are the values passed to the method. So this would be the, the semicolons here. So we're sending from this object, if we were to write this in C++, we would go I2 computer science dot set undergrads open bracket 120 close bracket. Uh, but we're running it in this format because we're using Objective-C. This concept's the same. Shows it in the same spot, same, same format. We create an instance of the object and we run the methods on the object. Uh, the pool drain, etc., is uh, applying to the methods. It's actually uh, freeing up the memory. The built-in message, the alloc, the init, the release that are all demonstrated in here. This is the main component of the driver. In fact, this is what you're going to see in here. You're going to see the release of the object. It's kind of like delete. You, know, you create an object and then you, with new, and then you delete it. So here you use alloc to allocate it, in, in it to initialize it, and release to get rid of it. Same kind of concept, actually, in terms of its implementation. So alloc is the equivalent to the C++ new, but it also zeroes all of the variables, which is kind of interesting. New doesn't do anything. New just goes out and allocates. It doesn't actually assign any values. Alloc actually reminds me of malloc, 
and we'll do the alloc. It reminds me of C. This is C. So alloc is the C memory allocator. Um, but it's used in C++ kind of fashion, which is kind of weird. And that's why I say when you start looking at Objective-C, it's a combination of all these different languages. So if you can just think of it as a new, uh, but it also does zero creates. If it's an integer, it'll create a zero. If it's a string, it'll be an empty string, et cetera, and so forth. And it should be applied to an instance before you use it. Why they just didn't like leave it alone? Why do they require the init? And in, in retrospect, looking at the language, I'm sure there's cases in which you don't want to initialize it because when you init, you actually allocate the memory. So perhaps it was to conserve resources. And maybe I don't know. Init something and then use it and then. But and it's kind of a required step in order for that instance to actually become come to life. And uh, these are often combined in shorthand. And here's the shorthand where we've got computer science alloc in it. That's all part of computer science. And then this is the name of the object I2 science, which is equal to. This would be new computer science in the old days, C++ days. So there's no garbage collection on the iPhone. Uh, so you should release all of the instance memory, which is why we have the pool drain and the release. Uh, so the release is going to do the garbage collection. So um, just like C++ that does not have built-in garbage collection either, same concept actually applies. So if we were to compile example number three, which I'm not going to do for you, you can actually save that as an assignment for yourself. You can, once you get your Xcode installed, you create the project in Xcode, you delete the original main, you add all of the existing files from the slide set, compile and you run it. So I don't believe I have to do this for you. I think you can probably do it on your own. Uh, so the next part of this slide is going to go through some basic data structures slash things and not everything about the language, uh, but some things to note in terms of its uh, syntax, in terms of the uh, usage. Objective-C arrays are similar to C arrays, but you can initialize the whole array in the list or just a few indices of the, of the array. The rest are set to zero which actually C++ sort of does as well. You can, there's ways of doing it. If you follow it, just set everything to zero. Just make it equal to zero. Opening and closing squiggly brackets and the entire array is equal to zero. So it's kind of the same concept, but this does it automatically for you. So you can, or you can mix and match. So an example here will create an array of size eight. And so uh, uh, this, this, this will create size eight. So integer three, we have one, two, three. We can add it this way. We can do it this way. We can do it this way. And everything would be set to zero. So, and we're in this array 3 would be equal to 11, 2 would be equal to 1, 7 would be equal to 0. So we have some shorthand, some slightly different extensions, but it's pretty similar. We also have support for multi-dimensional arrays as well. Um, it can be initialized by using a subset notation as well with brackets. So no, no comma after the second subset, which is kind of different. Subset brackets are optional. Compiler will fill it in with blanks uh, where, it, where it can um, in terms of the one-dimensional arrays. So. We can put the commas in. So you can kind of see this is this last one is not put in. So. Arrays and functions. Arrays uh, can be passed as arguments to functions. Same thing as they can in C++. Function will print every integer in an array, but it needs to also be told how long the array is. Same thing as C++. Uh, arrays aren't self-identifiable in terms of their length in C++ either. Uh, so statements with hard-coded indices such as array 4 are potentially dangerous especially if you send the wrong length so this looks like a C++ uh, function argument and so we have void function and now what do we got here the array itself plus the length of the array and then in the array we're going to do some sort of uh, some iteration with the array loop so arrays are just like C++ actually so in structures, believe it or not, similar to Objective-C, the struct can be uh, initialized uh, on the go, in one go. It can be, you can use the dot notation, actually. So this is kind of where it's a little bit different. The method calls are using a different notation. So they're not using the dot notation. So use the dot member notation or just use the values in the correct order. Or use some values as unknown if you wanted to, which is a little different. It's a little bit more flexible than C++. So in the following example, we're going to explicitly define the last member, but the other members are going to be undefined. So in this particular case, we have a computer science student that has three data members in uh, this structure. And then in the structure here, we're going to say it's a uh, structure computer science is equal to my career, which is equal to one, two, three. 
And then now we have just this one here. Unknown is three. Poor life decisions. <laughs> three, eight, three. Um, furthermore, well spent years is equal to zero. So in terms of well spent years. So it's um, a few different changes. The concept's the same. The syntax is slightly, can be more flexible in terms of the assignment. Or you can use them like C++ structures and use the dot notation to assign everything. There are no unions, actually, just the structure, no union support. So the de declare the plus define, <coughs> the structure in one in terms of the declaration and the uses of it, similar to the older C style notation. For example, it's going to declare a coffee order structure and immediately define an instance of it called complex coffee. You just put it on the last line, the end and closing squarely bracket. If you did this in C++, it's the same thing, actually, in Objective-C. So it's the definition and then the initialization of a new type all in one. It's kind of a shorthand method. So. Older C programmers did this a lot. And then they decided, well, it's kind of confusing. So then they decided to put all the structures in one h file, dot h file, and include the file, and then make instances of those structures. A little bit easier to see. So fitting into limited memory, we have bit fields that we can use. So to work on devices, and this is the interesting thing. So Objective-C is actually customized for different types of programming environments. Um, so we can take advantage of di different types of data types that can serve memory. So we're only allocating what we need to use. So on a phone, we don't really normally have as much memory as we do on a computer. So to work on a device with uh, memory limitations, to manually define the byte size of variables. So using a structure, all of the members are packed together efficiently inside. So the next example is going to divide a 16-bit unsigned integer into three on and off bits and a 10-bit number and a three-bit and a three-bit number. Now that is valid to use Boolean operations on single-bit variables as well. So we have unsigned integer, door alarm triggered, uh, window alarm triggered, basically the different sensors that would be tested for an alarm kind of situation. And then we can set lab dot. If we create a new instance of it and called it lab, dot alarm code is equal to one. So we check, assign it essentially. But it's using unsigned as bits, essentially, bit integers. So to fit limited measure for the unions, um, as I mentioned, the union data structures allow ambiguity. Uh, it's kind of it's not exactly the same as the union, however, that's supported in C. Useful for allowing one storage area to hold different variable types. And uh, it actually does, you, you can flip between, well actually, I guess, you know, in retrospect, I guess it is the same as C++, because you can flip between different data types for different variables that are held inside of the unions. So I take that back. It is supported the same way. I was thinking about it a little bit differently a few minutes ago. Uh, but in terms of the implementation, it holds one variable at a time, just like the union in C++. You know. Must be careful to ensure the retrieval type matches the last type stored. Um, might come in handy for storing a list of data that might have different types associated with it, but you don't want to take up all the memory. So you spe specify union instead and you only allocate one of the variables. Next example gives a potential practical use of it, a series of recordings. So you just store it as data. And so the structure has a clear, uh, it's, it has a character to indicate the type of the data recorded in the data um, structure. So. So here we have a union, one of the following, it's going to be a letter, it's going to be a character, an integer, or a float. And then we're going to use either assign a character, an integer, or a float. Um, so exactly the same as you would impl implement it in a C++ uh, program. So. Simulating the iOS apps relies heavily on Xcode IDE, obviously. Uh, iPhone iPad simulation program is a, hands, is a free add-on to Xcode. It actually comes automatically now. Can you install Xcode without it? I think you can, actually. You can install Xcode without it, or you can install it and it comes with Xcode. Like I think, in terms of the iOS. Actually, you can, because I have I have another computer that has Xcode, but it doesn't have the iPhone stuff on it. So You just need a Mac computer and developing iOS app for it, or running or testing the apps on the actual device is not free. I think it's like $100 a year or something like that. According to Slides, I think it's still around $100. The Slides, that's about a year old or so. so. Process for deploying, we're not going to get into this, but uh, if you wanted to, you could uh, 
sign, sign up as a developer, like a real developer, pay a developer fee. Are you a developer? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so this is all boring for you. <laughs> so <laughs> same software comes with one bundle, less. So how long have you been a developer then? You taking this class for an easy A then, huh? Because <laughs> this is like for brand new people. <laughs> so GUI designer, Apple organizer, all sorts of stuff that comes with it. Something to note. You can program for either the iPhone or the iPad on both the latest versions. Actually, um, did they ever have two different versions? I know they had the iPhone out first, and then they came out, and lo and behold, the iPad showed up. Yeah. And then for a while, there was no API for the iPad, and then they put it all into one. It's just like the Android. You can do um, Galaxy tabs. Um, you can do the, I can't remember what the other one's called, all in the same, all in the same API. Yeah. In fact, I have a Galaxy tab. I'm actually kind of interested in get, get, using the emulator for that. But I'm afraid to try it because the uh, the Android phone itself crashes on me every time I try to load it up. So, so if you're going to do examples uh, for both simulations, uh, be aware that there are two sets of the .h and .m files, one for each one of them. The specifications and the implement the implementations and the interfaces are different for iPhone versus iPad. You actually have two separate simultaneous. The code is sort of the same, but you have different uh, sets that you're going to need for that. And in terms of the frameworks, this is an example of the frameworks, the UI kit framework for developing standard iOS GUIs, buttons, stuff like that. I'm not going to go through all this because it's kind of boring. Uh, UI text field, stuff like that. View fonts, images, buttons, tons of different little, they used to call them widgets, now they're called frameworks. So, widgets, frameworks. It's event driven, obviously, just like the uh, Android platform. It's GUI based. You put something out, you create events for the touching or the moving or the. They're actually, you know, I would say there's one thing that's a little bit different between the iPhone, iPad kind of category. They're more, uh, less events slash more processing, I think, associated with them. I don't know, from my exposure to some of the apps. Although you can get the same app on both platforms, but. There seems to be like a lot more readers, you know, like an application kind of thing on an iPad to read a, you know, read a magazine or the news group stuff. Or um, it seems more application versus toy oriented. I don't know. It might just be my own view of it, my own exposure to different apps. Obviously, I haven't downloaded all apps for it, but I did have an iPhone at one point, and uh, excuse me, an iPad, the first generation iPad. I sold it because. The new one came out, you know, so it's old. And I didn't buy the new one, though, so I went to the Galaxy tab instead. <laughs> but long story short, I had apps on there for presentation, for, for uh, showing, like, PowerPoints and for projector stuff and for note-taking, and I uh, did some auto-recording stuff. I had yet to see anything for my Galaxy tab that even comes close to that, which is kind of weird. So maybe there is benefit to the purchasing of apps <laughs> and the app store and the quality of the apps that come out of iPhone and the iPad versus the open market on the Google end of it. I don't know. It might just be an observation. I'm sure there's decent apps on both, but I just, I personally have discovered more value in the iPhone related stuff, iPad related stuff, I should say. Okay, back to the boring slide. The IEB action, IEB output, we'll see those triggering events, triggering mouse events, output events, capturing output uh, from events that occur. We get the same thing on the Android, actually, looking at events. As uh, so the tags are not compiled, uh, they don't affect the code, but they sit as an extra uh, before the variables that the interface designer can see. So, Starting a new Xcode project, an iOS project, I'm going to kind of save this until next week when we're going to run iPhone apps and we're going to build projects next week. Uh, but uh, new project, we just select the type just the same as we selected DOS console application today for the Windows DOS-based program. Navigation-based, we have a navigation controller. And in fact, I'm not going to go back to I don't know if it's still up there, but yeah, it is probably still open. Let's see. If we go up to the different types in terms of, uh, if I click on an application here, we have got different type selections, which is a little bit different from the Android uh, environment, because we can actually kind of uh, window-based versus utility program versus navigation-based application. We can actually kind of customize the package or the application project a bit more in terms of what we're looking at. If you compare it to the, um, if you compare it to the Android kind of app. Android's got one project type, 
let you load different packages into it and import different stuff. So, OpenGL is also supported. In fact, OpenGL is also supported on the Android. Uh, cut down version of OpenGL, ES. Actually, that's actually kind of open. The ES is actually kind of, uh, well, it's, it's all open source anyway, but you can download it and install that for uh, uh, dev C++ or bloodshed compiler, C++ compilers. It's pretty easy to do that. The tab bar is the app, uh, app and style on the iPod app. The utility, the flip side up, uh, it's a single style of stock quote apps. So view based, window based. Window based is, uh, we're going to use window based apps for uh, the ones that we're going to create in this class. So. Try it out. Try it out Hello World. There's a YouTube video. That's actually my YouTube video on there. So I'm going to watch the video. Build your first iPhone app. And the tutorial can be found at this location here. And uh, if you haven't done it already, do it. Uh, you don't have to do it. You're already you know how to do it. But uh, everybody else is brand new to it should do it. Next time we're going to do objective C programming and we're going to build more iPhone. So we've done with the basic. In fact, you have to, believe it or not, for a programming language, we actually have seen everything associated with it. That's all the code. It's creating the objects, running the methods with the parameters, and learning how to do the syntax on it. It's all covered. This is lecture number one. You can use it as a reference. You can buy tons of books out there, but what's in this lecture is really the difference between C++ and Objective-C. So You don't have to buy a huge old book for it. Uh, it's the same concept, but the only problem is a lot of Objective-C programmers have never studied C, and they don't know C++. And half of them don't even know Java. Well, Java's not really going to help you, but if... You know, if you have a C background, you're in great shape for... Actually, you're in great shape for learning a lot of languages. You can learn small talk pretty easily. So. Make sure to practice with the Hello World application before next week, and we're going to move forward with more complex stuff next week. And I'm going to put it all out on the behacker.com. I only have the first assignment out there. So, I don't know, actually, you know what? I may not even have the first assignment out there. I don't have any assignments populated out there yet, because I haven't decided. The problem is I have to assess the difficulty, or the excuse me, the average competency level of the class, and uh, which is hard to assess right now because I'm not seeing too many students show up. <laughs> so <laughs> I don't want to make it too easy, and I don't want to make it too hard. And then at the same token, you know, it's I can't get any feedback. So, well, I'll, I'll decide eventually. You'll have some programs to work on. In the next couple weeks, I'll have all of them out. So we'll see what happens. Thank you for showing. But we're done for today. Questions, comments, concerns? No, you guys are an easy class. <laughs> right. I'll see you next time for real iPhone application development.